Hey, Dr. Mitch Early Moran here. Wanted to give you guys a chance to get an overview of all things cannabis. This will be reasonable prep for the final exam in addictive and compulsive behaviors, or if you just happen to be interested in cannabis, this may be informative. Let's move to a general overview. You can see right here, I'm gonna go ahead and read everything. Not that I don't think you guys can read, but I know some of you need to listen to this while you're doing your homework or while you're doing your dishes. So let's make sure I cover history, gateway, <clears throat> subjective effects, cognition, social problems, uh, some of the health and medical effects, and finally, the joys of prohibition. Let's dive in, shall we? So first and foremost, I wanna think of the history of cannabis as kind of a history of really three different plants. We've got industrial hemp, something that's completely separate from medical use of cannabis, and then finally recreational cannabis. And each of these has to have a different perspective because in many ways it's a very different set of uses. So for industrial hemp here, what I really mean is hemp grown so the stalk is really long so you can make fiber. And ideally with THC less than 1.5%, there's no hiding uh, psychoactive recreational cannabis between these plants. What you end up doing is just cross-pollinating and wrecking both plants. It's really not some kind of way to get a medical or psychoactive plant at all. This is really all about the stalk. As we'll emphasize, uh, industrial hemp is older than cotton, linen, or wool, and apparently uh, much more eco-friendly. So here's a chance for us to really appreciate a plant that could help our world. Oh, here's a nice picture, in fact. You can see these plants are taller than this guy, and uh, you don't see any buds. The leaves are relatively small, too. It's really all about the stalk. In contrast to this, this is clearly not hemp. As you can see, these are some pretty big nugs from Getty Images, and nobody's going to weave that into cloth. Oh, I have an endearing photo here just to show some of the industrial uses. We do have rope. Uh, they made this nice hammock out of some hemp fiber and cloth. On the left here, we've got Robert Fulton, the guy who gets a lot of credit for work on the steam engine. Uh, ironically, the steam engine decreased the use of rope in the United States compared to before we had it, and everybody just sailed. Um, his dad actually had a hemp factory and made rope, so it's it's sort of ironic. He sort of put himself out of business. But if you take a close look at the history of hemp fiber, we do have data going back to 8,000 BCE for what it's worth, suggesting that uh, there was at least hemp fiber that um, folks used to decorate artistic clay pots. Linen is nowhere near that old, and cotton uh, even less old. So we've got a long history with this fiber and something we need to keep in mind when we're considering it. I know there's a lot of talk saying, oh, it won't hold a crease and it won't hold dye and it's really horrible. Well, it's just obviously not done right because literally every single one of these colors is present. You've got a range here, reds, purples, blues, and uh, nice whites and grays. And by all means, I really think you can make hemp fabrics just about any color you would possibly need. And as you can see here, the pants and socks made of hemp products also do a great job of making sure your butt doesn't look fat. Well, do we have data going back? Hemp fabric uh, was mentioned by Herodotus in 450 BCE. I think you know the father of history. Um, he came, came up with the neither snow nor rain nor all that stuff for the mailman. We borrowed that from him. Uh, cotton really did take over in the 1800s in part because of processing and in part because of harvesting issues. So, uh, oh, it's sad to say, but uh, in Thomas Jefferson's diary, it just says, hey, the, the harvesting and processing of hemp is really hard on my slaves. So I guess that's a little bit thoughtful on his part, but uh, truth be told, that's at least a contributor to why cotton seemed to do so well. And then the cotton gin was invented and really you know, took cotton a step ahead as far as that's concerned. We didn't have decorticators for that hemp stock that worked really well. 
Um, oh, a number of folks around the Revolutionary War time would complain the hemp seeds or hemp plants that were eaten by birds, if you shot that bird and ate it, it tasted funny. And you have to let it wet. You basically have to let the fiber sit and get all wet and just kind of rot a little bit before you can sort of shake it loose from the plant. So it's not a straightforward, pleasant process. We do a lot better now than we did, oh, in the 1770s. I did want to emphasize, too, that hemp seeds go way back as a food. So you occasionally see ground hemp seeds used in a number of sort of meals and uh, breakfast cereals and things like that. I used to get these roasted ones that were spiced and be able to give them away as Kahoot prizes, but uh, those days are gone. And I wanted to emphasize, too, they have some novel and interesting health benefits. So 28 grams, which I know is a number that means a lot to some of you, uh, basically two big tablespoons of hemp seeds. These contain some uh, minerals that we don't often find in other grains and a decent helping of vitamin E here. So you could have just these two tablespoons and get a lot of the nutrients you need. For those of you who are still wound up about your macros, it's 161 calories, uh, just three grams of carbs, nine grams of protein, which for a, you know, for a plant-based protein, that's pretty amazing. It's 12.3 grams of fat, but hey, it's plant fat, so don't drive yourself nuts, and two grams of fiber. Well, in addition to industrial hemp, let's go ahead and move on to the idea of medical cannabis. And of course, who gets credit for this good old Shenang? 2737 BC may sound a little overly precise. 2800 BC, I would certainly accept on the test. And you guys know I love talking about Shenang because he also gets credit for inventing Mahuang. And you know how I love talking about Mahuang. Bottom line though, this really has a whole bunch of different uh, medical uses discussed. I just want to emphasize a few things for the exam. The 1764 New England dispensatory basically list this as kind of a pharmacopoeia that really medical cannabis was already in use when we had the colonies before the United States was the United States. A couple of key names also in the history of medical cannabis I just want to make sure you know. Uh, O'Shaughnessy was the Irish guy who went to India for one of the British companies saw a lot of hemp uh, in use there and uh, did some medical studies on his own, gave hemp to dogs, had these wild hypotheses about vegetarians being insensitive to cannabis, which uh, the data do not support. Uh, in 1845, we got Jean-Jacques Moreau, my uh, favorite French fan for the uh, hashish club. And basically all the artsy fartsy poets and writers of that day used to go there and Moreau would be throwing these hash parties. I don't know how else to describe it. He'd hand you a tablespoon of some kind of sugary hash treat and say this will be taken from your allotment in heaven and basically study everyone. And he did write a book about it <clears throat> that won an award later on. And the other big physician name I just want you guys to know is good old Dr. Lester Grinspoon, who not only has a, a cannabis strain named after him, a honor I still envy, but he was a uh, source of the 1971 book, Marijuana Reconsidered. Uh, poor guy never did get promoted a full professor at Harvard, but he was a Harvard professor until he retired and really did an amazing job as far as defending cannabis based on data rather than the reputations it had. And you can hear his story. It's, it's a delightful one. Well, so I do want to get into some of the active ingredients, although we'll do more on medical cannabis in just a few minutes. But the take home message here is we've got our sort of classic cannabinoids and we're learning more and more about them every day. So we had 104, 105, you know, there's always going to be quite a few that are unique to the plant. But my hope is we'll find out more about the ones we do know rather than go crazy about the ones we don't. So. The classic tetrahydrocannabinol is the one we've known about the longest, seems to be uh, far and away the most prevalent in most of the strains we see today, and has a wonderful set of potentially 
medicinally aiding effects, including analgesic, anxiolytic, soporific, appetite enhancing, and anti-nausea. And I'll elaborate on these more when we get to the medical cannabis section, but I would reassure you it's uh, definitely worth knowing these and knowing what each of those words means. The other classic now that's getting a ton of press lately is cannabidiol, CBD. I want to emphasize that uh, there are also a number of really great uh, effects documented, but often at dosages markedly higher than you may be seeing in the gummy bears at your local gas station. I took a poke at this at that uh, Netflix show Rotten, the last episode of season two is all about high on edibles, and I emphasize that this is, uh, is kind of an issue uh, somewhere in the first 40 minutes of that episode, if you get a chance to see it, it's, it's worth watching. Bo Kilmer's in there, all the, all the crazy cannabis wonks. So the anxiolytic effects of cannabidiol, of course, are pretty well documented, but only around 300 milligrams and only in response to sort of laboratory stressors that we've seen. Folks who take 10 milligrams a day and swear by it, I completely bow to you. I'm just eager for the randomized clinical trial with the placebo and really don't want to interrupt, but also should point out uh, 12 sessions of cognitive behavior therapy should handle a lot of folks' anxiety too. Now the antipsychotic effects, uh, friend of Bert, I'm, a friend of mine in Germany is basically uh, administering 800 milligrams and sometimes more to folks with psychotic symptoms and they really do seem to be benefiting a lot just keeping that magical ideation and some of the hallucinations really the voices down I wanted to emphasize this because uh, it's also an explanation for the troubles we see with Marinol. So Marinol, as you know, is that synthetic THC that's uh, suspended in sesame oil. It is not a fun substance to take. It's literally THC all by itself. And it looks like CBD kind of takes that psychotic edge off of THC when it's administered by itself. So a good thing to know and a good explanation for why Marinol doesn't work. We'll get into that some more when we talk about medical uses as well, but the take-home message is Marinol comes in doses that you pretty much have to eat when uh, things like nausea and vomiting, you don't want to have to swallow something in order to alleviate those symptoms. The anti-seizure data, um, again, really impressive, at least uh, in the subset of seizure disorders uh, that appears in children. Uh, Dr. Warren Davinsky, a just delightful epilepsy doc down there, has been giving kids, again, also quite a bit, often, uh, well, based on their weight, but uh, an easy 800 milligrams uh, per day, and it does make them fatigued and occasionally has some GI symptoms uh, associated with it, but as side effects go, it sure beats the hell out of having 300 seizures a day. The soporific effects, so... Ethan Russo emphasizes that CBD by itself actually should be a stimulant and that a lot of these tinctures that are uh, helpful for sleep probably have cannabidiol and some psychoactive terpenes. But what I notice essentially is, uh, the data suggests, people go uh, sort of stimulated up for like about an hour and then come back down with a pretty reasonable crash and then they fall asleep just fine. So if you do want to use CBD uh, as a sleep aid, make sure your you know, behavioral interventions are good, you're not watching screens till all hours, your you know, sleep hygiene is excellent, and then if you take CBD, take it an hour and a half, an hour before you want to fall asleep. Now, does it have anorectic effects? At high doses by itself, we can't quite tell, but it definitely takes that munchies edge off of THC when THC is administered by itself. Now, this is a horrible thing to add if you're actually trying to enhance your appetite because of, you know, cancer chemotherapy-related problems with eating or, uh, you know, HIV meds you might be on that are uh, messing with your appetite. So you wouldn't want to add CBD then. You want to make sure the THC can really uh, enhance it as much as you want. But it's kind of nice to know that CBD has that potential if you uh, need to use huge THC for other purposes and want some CBD there to make sure you don't eat all the donuts in the house. The other um, 
cannabinoid I want to mention is THCV, which looks like it's got uh, some potential anorectic effects, both in uh, undoing THC's appetite enhancement and maybe even decreasing appetite by itself. Uh, Tetrahydrocannabivarin, and you know, you'll know it when you see it. And then cannabinol, which we don't hear about a lot, CBN, um, allegedly one-tenth as strong as THC, at least in some of the animal literature, supposedly enhances some immune properties, increases sleep, decreases temperature. We see this at relatively high doses. It may decrease THC-induced stimulation, alter some of its subjective effects, and then increase the THC's duration. Uh, at least one company I know has been experimenting with this as a sleep aid. At least one has it out on the market now. It's kind of unpredictable, and I got to say, uh, well, proceed with caution if you, if you want to experiment with those. Finally, I did want to have a little exclamation point beside the terpenes, because the terpenes are in lots and lots of plants, and hey, we happen to evolve at the same time as plants. So I did want to point out that terpenes have a number of effects that cannabis often gets credit for, and I'm not saying that the cannabis part doesn't contribute, because certainly THC alone in the lab creates a number of these effects as well, but we definitely have terpenes that are anxiolytic. Uh, linalol, the one that's in lavender, seems to be uh, a pretty impressive anxiolytic at appropriate doses, at least from the aromatherapy literature. Uh, limonene, the one in all those citrusy related strains, uh, lemon kush, you know, if it's got orange or lemon or lime or anything in the name, odds are high it's got limonene and that has some stimulant effects at higher doses. General mood enhancing effects, again, uh, a number of terpenes, um, I mean, you can imagine any flower that smells good or a plant that smells good that might make your mood better, odds are high that's from a terpene. Uh, there are also decent sleep aids and really impressive antioxidants, but I could say that about uh, a ton of plants. I'd rather see you go take uh, a gram of turmeric or ginger than drive yourself nuts trying to isolate terpenes just for antioxidant effects. Well, that gets us to sort of our third history. In this case, it's as an intoxicant. So I do want to give Shenang another shout out just because... I wanted to talk about Mahuang. No, just because he, you know, did point out that at high doses, cannabis would make you see evil spirits. Um, but really, uh, part of uh, the Hindu deity Shiva apparently uh, references it. And there's an intriguing story about Shiva underneath a plant and it falling somewhere into tea. And it depends on, you know, how you see it. But uh, basically... Shiva gets credit in the Hindu religion for bringing cannabis to humans. Um, Herodotus also mentioned, in addition to hemp fiber, uh, psychoactive hemp, uh, but he was reporting on the Scythians, basically this neighboring tribe that was sometimes enemy, sometimes friend of the Greeks. Um, he said they would throw the seeds on fires inside tents during funerals. And I realize that may not sound like your stereotypical... Irish wake, but the chance to uh, assume he means the buds, not just the seeds, and that people would go in there, you know, puff the smoke and then be more in touch with their uh, grief and negative emotions, that, that's no big surprise. And I did mention before in class, uh, near 100, a number of the Taoists, uh, a guy named Lee, what a surprise, uh, reported uh, you can definitely have some psycho effects. Uh, if you take just the right amount, you will actually live forever. Apparently that dosage has not been mastered, but at high doses you will get visions, so watch out. They also reference seeds. I, I really think they mean the buds. Now, all these dates can drive you a little bit nuts, and so I really don't want you to, to go crazy, but I just want you to know how long cannabis as an intoxicant has been part of our cultural awareness and that we've had lots and lots of folks saying, oh God, it must be evil for literally millennia. Um, so Pope Innocent VIII, which I know some of you know is my nickname, um, he condemns hemp because of its use in witchcraft. It sounded like a subset of folks, um, many of whom were female, were aware of medical cannabis's uh, abilities. People got that confused with, um, well, anything that wasn't Catholic, basically. 
and uh, decided that uh, it should be illegal on that alone. Uh, Napoleon's soldiers brought it back from Egypt. So basically, Napoleon's soldiers are stuck in Egypt. Uh, sounded like they didn't bring a lot of liquor with them. Suddenly, they meet uh, natives there in Africa who do have this plant they seem to enjoy. So Napoleon's soldiers really enjoy it and bring it back up to France. Napoleon was a little less than thrilled uh, about that one, but uh, nonetheless, kind of laid the groundwork so that in 1830s, the hashish club could get started. So Gautier, Baudelaire, Flaubert, Dumas, Baudin, basically all these hipster French writers got hash from Moreau and went ahead and either wrote about its experiences or wrote about other people experiencing it and kind of gives us a nice view into perceptions of the intoxicant properties. How about good old United States? Well, it wasn't until 1857 we have a book length uh, contribution from Fitzhugh Ludlow. He wrote The Hashish Eater. Now, you may recall um, The Opium Eater we talked about in that opiate section, so this was sort of modeled after that, and Fitzhugh Ludlow gets credit for it. We did have um, a poem written about, at least alluding to cannabis earlier than this, but let's, let's call this the sort of big American contribution to the hashish literature, that uh, first of its kind, so to speak. And I'm yeah, clearly emphasizing, I think those are important. The other date as far as history of intoxicant is worth, and you guys have heard me perseverating on this in class, is that in 1937, Ansinger passed the Marijuana Tax Act, and I'm not going to split hairs about how he pulled that off, but basically signing some international treaties where cannabis was added to something that was designed to essentially keep opiates to a minimum, and then basically going around to the federal government and saying, hey, we signed this, this treaty, we got to make this illegal now, and not having much of a budget and hoping the states would chime in, and oh, what a surprise, everything went awry from there. I'll get into some of that when we do the legal issues. And I did just want to draw some distinctions because uh, whether you think of this as intoxicant or religious use, certainly in India there was a time when there were fine distinctions among different cannabis substances and just wanted you to know so ganja is the tops really it's it's the buds cheris was resin that hash that basically the trichomes are shaken off those glands are pressed together to make something that was uh in addition to being markedly more potent also uh something that would last longer and be easier to transport and then bong i may have shown you my student archana's recipe for bong but it's basically rose water leaves of pot and um, sugar, almonds, you know, stuff whipped up to make a, a, a nice drink that happens to be psychoactive. Sounds like the range of potency really did depend on the potency of the plant available, and, and she mentioned even, you know, her mother got it from her grandmother when she was a little kid. It was just something you kind of gave people when they came over like you were having a beer. All right, well, I hope that gives you a good feel for the business with the history. You got some hallmark dates there. You know the general trends. Some are for hemp, some are for medicine, some are for the intoxicant. As, as usual, let's focus on the key points rather than driving yourselves nuts memorizing just a bunch of numbers. I want to make an important transition now to discussing the alleged gateway theory, stepping stone, this notion that cannabis somehow made you crave hard drugs the way salt makes you thirsty. So depending upon whom you ask, uh, the gateway is you start out with one drug and then it drives you to the next one somehow. Uh, so you might uh, be a kid who likes caffeine early in life, suddenly you're more likely to use alcohol or nicotine and the order of those is often uh, flipped in some models and not others. And then you try cannabis and then suddenly whammo, you blast through all these hard drugs until lo and behold, you're strung out on heroin the next day. Obviously, we must have 100 million Americans who've used cannabis at least once and maybe 6 million heroin addicts. I, I just don't see much of a gateway just from the numbers, but I do want to uh, point out that there are probably better explanations for this that have to do with one idea, and that's people who like to do drugs 
like to do drugs. So, hey, sensation seekers who go all the way down this path tend to account for any illusion of a gateway. And truth be told, way more people have used cannabis than who've even seen heroin. Obviously, we can't randomly assign humans to use cannabis or not, so at least not long-term and at an early age. So we tried to do some animal work on this. It's really hard with the rodents. Rodents really don't like THC. It makes them paranoid and then they eat all the cheese and they think there's an eagle around and it's, it's hard on them. So it's super hard to actually get them to self-administer THC after being exposed to THC, never mind any other drugs. In some really offensively horrid paradigms where squirrel monkeys basically have nothing to do because they're tied down. They will administer cocaine if they've been given THC first at a more rapid rate than if they hadn't been given THC first. I'm eager to see if that replicates and I just ugh, I can only take it so seriously given the artificiality of the environment. And as you may remember I often emphasize Large proportions of folks who are problematic hard drug users used hard drugs way before they used cannabis. So I often emphasize Allen Ginsberg, who shot heroin and then learned about marijuana. So heroin was the gateway drug. Now I just wanted to list some classic examples, literally from decades ago, where folks who were in treatment for hard drugs not only hadn't started with cannabis, they started with the hard drugs. So you might be able to remember the name Blaze if you see that on the test. I'm not going to get that specific. Just get the idea across that a lot of folks don't use cannabis before they use hard drugs, so so much for the gateway. And far and away, I emphasize this old classic morale study, but basically here's what I think is going on. is There's a personality trait here, I'm calling it sensation seeking. A subset of folks who really just go all out and they happen to use cannabis and amphetamine and cocaine and heroin if you know they've got this personality and some of the availability in their environment obviously they also don't like to put a condom on their willy they love the front car of the roller coaster clearly you know it's not that drugs are making them do these things this is all part of a larger disinhibited quality it's not that I think there's an addictive personality, it's I think some people are more into novel and interesting experiences. The lesson, if there is one, is basically you are the chooser for what goes inside your own body. So by all means, cannabis may be something you enjoy. That doesn't mean you're going to enjoy other drugs really at all. And the correlates, particularly with the opiates, are not good. It doesn't seem like it's a good predictor of responses to alcohol either. And in fact, if we have hard drugs available, that is the issue. It's as if prohibition is creating this illusion of gateway because folks who had to get cannabis had to go to the underground market where the hard drugs were also. So Craig Reinerman did this wonderful study basically comparing folks uh, in San Francisco when cannabis was still illegal to folks who lived in Amsterdam where cannabis uh, you could buy at that time I think 30 grams but you know at least five grams at a coffee shop and it was completely disconnected from the hard drug world lo and behold who was more likely to have used hard drugs the folks in San Francisco as you can imagine in part it was because in order to get cannabis they had to go often to people who also had hard drugs, and that seemed to be how prohibition essentially created this illusion of a cannabis gateway. We did have a whole lecture on subjective effects of cannabis. I realize these are not an outrageous big mystery anymore. Uh, essentially, you saw all the positive ones primarily because People who volunteer for these studies or who end up participating have used cannabis 12 times or more in some of the selection criteria. So of course they're going to say cannabis was uh, a happy experience. 
Some of the data from my lab suggests there's some sedation and some stimulation. A number of people have tried to break these factors down to get at every single possible effect cannabis could have. I think that may be a, a bit of over overkill. But there's this other subset of folks who really do not like cannabis. And uh, one subject effect they report is depersonalization. That, that's kind of similar to the symptom that folks report when they're experiencing panic. So depersonalization, literally you don't feel like you're a person anymore. Reality seems to be unattached. It's super uncomfortable and aversive, at least the way they describe it. I did emphasize too that this is often dose dependent. So almost everybody, what a surprise, who's ever used edibles has an aversive edibles experience story. So my student Stacy Farmer just published a paper suggesting that, yep, it really is aversive. It really is dosage related. People do not like it. It's super uncomfortable, but it doesn't send them to the emergency room. It usually sends them to bed early or maybe to uh, ask a friend to sit with them. It's you know not this giant catastrophe it's often made out to be. And mm, a great many of them not only went on to try edibles again, but at lower doses, but in addition, uh, about 7-8% of them said this was actually one of the most meaningful experiences of their lives. So again, as I make a stand for having the milligrams of THC labeled in every product, especially edibles project, and by all means, start with five or less and go slow. If you get up in the 40s, it's going to be challenging for a whole lot of people. So do not do that unless you are an experienced high tolerance user. Let's move quickly now to Canvas's impact on cognition. The key here is to understand there are both acute effects and chronic effects of cannabis on cognition. I just mean either right after you used it or effects on the way you think or the way your brain works when you're no longer high, but because you have used it so many times. Obviously, we don't want these to be confounded, and yet this can be a big issue because folks who <laughs> use O oh, every day for two years in a row uh, often are not experiencing the acute effects when they're taking some of these tests, so we want to make sure we keep that in mind before we assume cannabis creates chronic effects when really we're just studying acute ones. Well, so the acute effects on cognition really aren't all that complicated, and I would say the take-home message is you can't encode new information, and it may be motivational. It may just be a uh, fact that CB1 receptors are all over the hippocampus, but also that easy tasks are actually unaffected. So I uh, talked about the paired associates tasks, and there's an easy version where you have words like baby goes with cries. So if I said baby, you'd say cries. If I say cries, you say baby. That's an easy one, and what a surprise. Even at very high doses, people aren't impaired on that uh, acutely, in contrast to a uh, rather difficult one. So uh, imagine uh, recondite goes with leviathan. Obviously, this one's going to be harder to learn, and at uh, high doses, cannabis may show impairment on these sort of difficult or hard paired associates tasks. But remote memory, I just mean you're not going to forget your first grade teacher's name if you know it when you're not high. You're you know, not going to forget your own telephone number again if you know it when you are not high. With that in mind, we do see more impairment on more complex tasks. So obviously simple reaction time, not a big deal. Hey, press the space bar when you hear the ding. Not, not a lot of impairment, even a high dose of acute use of cannabis. More complicated ones, okay, press the space bar when you hear that ding, press the letter B when the blue light goes on, press the letter R when the red light goes on. Now things get a little bit tougher. But I do want to emphasize that these uh, effect sizes are often fairly small, and you'll notice as you go through some are significant, some are not, it's almost always that they're significant when the N is large. So this is telling me, hey, these studies need to be replicated with large samples to get a better estimate of the size of that effect. 
The other issue is always, is it motivational? So um, Bob Peel had done some work where he said, okay, every time you get this right, you'll get a quarter. And a quarter doesn't mean a lot to, to folks when they're high. And a lot of these tasks are kind of a buzzkill. So I, I'm unsure how to control for that. We'll bring up this motivational issue more when we're talking about chronic effects. With that in mind, what do we find? Well, the evoked potentials on these folks are deviant, and by that I mean brain waves that are uh, in response to some kind of stimulus. So you've got that brain wave measuring the EEG thing on your head, and it's going to measure the wave that happens after you experience certain stimuli. We can get into the details of it, but those do seem to be deviant in uh, long-term heavy users or uh, even after two years of daily use. But we don't see any changes in brain structure, at least with adult use. Uh, the IQ effects I've discussed before, so longitudinally, Peter Fried has these data suggesting that folks who were uh, smoking pot heavily early in life had this IQ drop of eight points. Well, when you look very closely at those data, first of all, you find that the folks who used five to seven days a week had that, but the folks who only got high on weekends uh, actually had an IQ improvement compared to the control group. So I'm guessing that really this is just who's smart and who is not and who picks cannabis to use and who does not, but separate, separate issue. Obviously, heavy use early in life, early teens, does have some brain structure issues that have been reported, but they're not always replicating. So at gunpoint, if I had to say, is there something, the proportion of gray to white matter is probably off, meaning that your brain is a little less efficient if you started smoking pot uh, at heavy doses uh, before age 15 or so, even before age 18 on some data. Returning to that IQ thing though too, I often note that uh, the parts of the IQ test that are crystallized rather than fluid, meaning something that you should have learned in school are often where the deficits show up. So if I you know, went to school high, of course I didn't encode anything new. We've already established that. So I you know, forgot the capital of Maine because I never really knew it. And then when that's on the test, duh, it looks like I've got a low IQ when really it's just I didn't learn a lot of things that people my age would have learned had they been at school that day and not high. The memory effects are small but replicable. As I mentioned, that sort of half a word thing there are certain tasks uh, that even with chronic users are just not uh, at the very great peak that uh, other memory uh, performances in non-users show, but they're few and far between. I'm unclear if they have any real practical utility. Well, I want to turn now to some of the key social problems then. Uh, there's amotivational syndrome, which I can hardly say with straight face. Uh, talking about some of the driving literature and uh, if cannabis has an impact on accident rates and things like that. And finally, the never-ending alleged link between cannabis use and aggression. So let's jump right in on the A-motivation. Now, A-motivation was basically the idea that somehow smoking pot was going to turn you into this unmotivated, unmotivated slug who never wanted to do anything and really... Those were the symptoms of this alleged syndrome. Uh, it sounded a lot like being an adolescent. So in the lab work, they've got some interesting uh, residential findings where people literally lived in the lab. Uh, Richard Fulton's lab, Cohen had some data out at UCLA, literally in the 1970s, day after day, and had placebo or cannabis or nothing on different days, and we got to sort of see what they did. I do want to emphasize that outside the lab work, one of the biggest confounds is depression. So a number of folks turned to cannabis in an effort to, you know, relish some of its anti-depression effects, which are probably just <laughs> a legend. So once you take the depressed folks out on some of these studies, you realize, oh, hey, this isn't, this isn't the issue. It's that depressed people show less motivation than normal, and that's just a, a symptom of depression. By all means, Good old cognitive behavior therapy is going to be one of your buddies uh, rather than cannabis. And then get your treatment and then you can enjoy your cannabis a lot more. Finally, some other measures, the lifetime measures. Mostly we see stuff on grades. 
and then employment. Often it's uh, taxes paid or money earned or occasionally got fired as, as measures of a motivation. Or Well, the lab work was pretty unimpressive as far as any evidence for a motivation. So one of my favorites was uh, the Miles studies where they had to build these chairs and I think they got $2 and something per chair. And on the days they got high, they were occasionally building fewer chairs or not getting as much work done, but then they all got together and went on strike so they could get more money per chair. So uh, I believe union organizers everywhere uh, tipped their hats. And it's kind of hard to say that that's rather compelling evidence for a whole syndrome. It does seem like folks do maybe treasure their leisure time a little more if they have cannabis available. And then Cohen's work in 76, they had these other tasks, mostly like doing these ridiculously dull uh, oh, math problems or outlining uh, notes from text and things like that. And not a really big consistent effect, but uh, again, nothing that would support the idea of a syndrome. In Fulton's lab, they did notice that uh, days when folks had psychoactive cannabis, they didn't do the aversive tasks. They didn't do the chores. They didn't do the cleanup. They didn't kind of snap to it on some of the things they were supposed to get done in a day while they were living there. So, wow. Uh, if that's a syndrome, um, let he who is not sin cast first stone. So, again, I mentioned that depression and some of the confounds for these lifetime measures. For grades... In college, there are actually some data suggesting folks who use cannabis have higher grades, but I don't want to make too much of that. It was maybe like 0.18, you know, not, not even a, a fifth of a grade point, and some of them are nulls. The high school students, you do see a subset of high school students who use cannabis who do have lower grades, but when the data are available, go back to when they were in fourth grade, when it was pretty unlikely they were using cannabis, and what a surprise they had lower grades back then too. So it may not be so much that cannabis is making you less motivated and decreasing your grades, it's that folks who are kind of alienated or are not into the school thing, maybe not destined to be academics, do seem to turn to cannabis and get deviant friends and things like that. Now this does turn into a hassle when you don't finish high school, which is a big blunder and one that does take its toll on lifetime earning potential because how much money you make is super important but uh something something to keep in mind now whether that's a motivational syndrome i'm not too impressed and then the employment data are also not particularly supportive of the notion of some kind of syndrome depending upon where you do the study so in costa rica places like that uh folks seem to smoke more pot if they've got better employment, but I think it's really that the causality is backwards. They've got enough money to be able to afford pot and have time to use it. And if they don't have money and have to run around looking for jobs, then of course they don't use it. So it's, it's just an, an ass backwards order of operations there. And then Kasner had some data in the 90s, just big economics data sets where essentially uh, for men, at least, there was one uh, data set where uh, the more money you made, the more pot you smoked. And again, I think it was probably in that direction, not, not the other. The invol involuntary loss of a job does seem to increase. And uh, join the club if you've ever lost a job in some way, directly or indirectly, because of your cannabis use. I don't think it has a lot to do with going high on the job so much as just attitudes about cannabis. Um, and again, we're talking about odds ratios 1.3 at the most, you know, never even a doubling of the rate of getting fired or anything like that. So I, I don't want to make too much of that. So all in all, a motivational syndrome is a bunch of nonsense. If you do have a teenager who is depressed and defiant and you want to blame it on cannabis, I really think you're wasting your time. All right. The dreaded driving. Obviously, we do not want to have people driving around impaired for any reason. It's dangerous not only to the driver, but to other people as well. I want to emphasize there are a number of drugs that make bad drivers. And if you're just listening to this, please come over and take a look at this slide because what I have here is a graph where 
the folks who were in the drug condition and the folks who were in the placebo condition are being compared on the standard deviation of their lateral position, which is really just a measure of how much do they wave back and forth in the lane. Now, I'm not talking about they're going across the center line crazy and nutty, but definitely not holding it right down the center. And you can see in this situation, the drug has definitely made that work. It's statistically significant. And I saw these data and wanted to emphasize that, oh, yeah, it's Benadryl. So uh, 50 milligrams of diphenhydramine, of course, is the drug that is doing this. And literally anybody can buy this over the counter almost anywhere in the United States. Definitely don't do Benadryl and drive. And with that in mind, I think the whole idea that we need to keep a drug illegal simply because it impairs driving is a notion we definitely want to rethink. Well, when you look back at some of the old classic reviews on who causes an accident and who does not, what's the story with some of this? In all honesty, the folks who were established cannabis users in some insurance data sets suggested that they were less likely to be the one to cause the accident. And again, not, you know, huge odds ratios, 0 0.8, 0 0.7, like, you know, a 30 to 20 percent less than average. No one believes it. It doesn't seem to be replicating a lot lately, but in part because nobody's looking. So I don't want to make too much of it either way. But I do want to walk through some of the things that are altered during cannabis intoxication and talk about uh, how folks compensate. So we definitely do see that increase in lateral movement where essentially staying down the exact center of the lane does seem to be more difficult. Again, we're not talking about swerving across lanes, just having a rough time staying down the center. But uh, Roby's data, literally in Amsterdam, people are driving around in the car high. They smoke pot there. The researcher says, do you want to drive now? They say, you mean outside? Nobody really wants to drive really high. It's quite the buzzkill. Um, hey, we're in the days of Lyft and Uber. This probably shouldn't even really be an issue. But there was no change in handling, maneuvering, or turning. How did they do it? What did they do in order to make sure they don't drive like idiots? Well, they decrease their speed, and they're markedly less likely to try to pass other cars. Now, I know this is kind of a stereotype, but yes, cannabis users do not drive faster, and they're not necessarily in a hurry to pass other cars. Also, we notice, uh, perhaps in the effort to compensate for things that they think uh, cannabis might do that are like alcohol, they increase their stopping distance. So if they see a stop sign, they start stopping markedly earlier, and they increase headspace, the space between their car and the car in front of them, so they're markedly less likely to, you know, have a fender bender of any type. Now, I do want to emphasize that alcohol in combination is a real um, mix-up, shall we say, so people don't know how to compensate. And even at 0.05, even at dosages that aren't considered a DWI, people are definitely impaired. Do not drink and get high and drive. It's time for an Uber. I also want to stress that we don't have any lab data on night driving or emergency situations where, you know, suddenly a little bunny jumps out and you have to hit the brake quickly in a real driving situation. We just, we just don't have those data. And so I do feel like recommendations for driving high have to be no, don't do it. So I am going to say don't drink and drive, as we've emphasized earlier this semester, and particularly if you've used cannabis. Don't drive high, but drive as if you were. Think about it. What do high people do? They go slower. They're less likely to try to pass. They're keeping more distance between their car and the car in front of them. And they see a stop sign and start slowing down early. What better way to drive is there? Now, if you're in a hurry, it's a time management issue, not a catch up on the road issue. Odds are high. If you're 10 minutes late, who's going to die, right? But if you have a rack, need I say more? All right, let's talk a minute now about some of the cannabis and medical reactions, if only to get a feel for what's going on in this literature. And is cannabis the panacea it's presented as? Probably not. 
Is cannabis a great treatment for a subset of symptoms? Absolutely. Is it the only treatment for every symptom? No, of course not. What drug is? With this in mind, let's think about the costs and benefits of cannabis use and the use of the alternative drugs. I'm going to harp hard on the pain-related meds because cannabis is a good analgesic at appropriate dosages, and right now we've got an opiate epidemic. If you decreased your opiates and increased your cannabis use, I guarantee you, you could have the same analgesic effects, and markedly fewer of those horrendous opiate-related side effects that nobody talks about, like constipation. There are ideographic reactions, not just to cannabis, but to different cannabis strains. I mean, different people are different strain dependent as well. I hate to say it, but the search for the right strain can be kind of grueling. Now, I invariably, especially if I'm on the radio, we get a call and says, hey, what about Marinol? We've already got it. You don't need this pot, dude. Marinol is something I'll discuss at length, but uh, Dronabinol, the synthetic THC in these capsules, and they come, they used to only be 10 milligram and five milligram, and 10 was basically like send you into outer space, dark side of the moon, five was didn't do any good. Now they have 2.5s, and it sounds like there's at least a little more variability, but it's orally administered. So if you got nausea, you got vomiting, oh, I could hit the vaporizer, literally have some relief in 15 seconds, or try to swallow a pill that's sometimes as much as six, eight bucks each, and not throw it up. Give me a break. Now, I think of cannabis often as an adjunct or part of a combination treatment. I don't feel like it's necessarily the key treatment for a whole lot of things. Some of the cannabinoids independently are, but we'll get to that. And again, my point is always to emphasize drug safety. And by that, I, no harm reduction is the term folks use, but it really does play up the harm. I want to say, hey, there are safe ways to use medical cannabis to have not only negative consequences be a minimum, but even any irritating side effects be a minimum. So there's Marinol now, the 10, the 5, and the 2.5. I haven't priced this in a while, and $8 each is probably an exaggeration, but uh, insurance companies, somebody's got to pay for this. The feds literally sponsored Unimed and practically bankrolled this entire project, and it's just THC, no chirpings, no other cannabinoids. It does not sound very pleasant. The other thing I want to keep in mind is the medical literature is huge and constantly moving. So I was just getting into uh, some of the nausea drugs. The nausea literature moves fast. There are brand new nausea drugs developed literally almost every year. It's astounding. Now, right now, yeah, cannabis really does look good for nausea and vomiting. There may be something cheap and effective that's going to come out next week. By all means, let's hope so. Obviously, the methods for dosing are going to be critical. We've got the chance to use uh, an extract sublingually. You see some of these tinctures where folks use food-based glycerin or alcohol and soak the plant in there until it's good to go. This is not as rapid as a vaporized, certainly not going to recommend smoking, but it's certainly faster than edibles or uh, Marinol, THC in the pill form, so maybe a happy medium for a few folks. I'm making fun of the American method here because you can only have so much THC in the American gizmo on the right. Uh, on the left in Europe, apparently, they trust you to actually dose yourself. Well, with that in mind, too, I do want to play up. I'm going to say, you know, here are all the wonderful medical potential uses, but there are some adverse uses. This vomiting thing, years ago, somebody said, hey, there's this cyclical hyperemesis syndrome, and it happens when you smoke pot uh, week after week, and the only cure is to take a shower, and you're in agony, and blah, blah, and I was like, yeah, bullshit. And I'm still wondering, is it neem oil poisoning? Is it because of heavy metals and uh, some bad underground cannabis? It's starting to look like there's a subset of folks who are just unlucky enough to have this happen. And so, by all means, if you can keep your dosage low and your frequency lower, you're less likely to ever have this develop, and I wouldn't wish it on my worst enemy. And then there are some cardiac 
effects acutely. So tachycardia, we've talked about before, basically cannabis increases heart rate. Sooner or later, because baby boomers are aging, we're going to have somebody who has a heart attack and tests positive for THC, and they're going to blame it on pot. Just raw numbers, given the number of heart attacks, guys my age and older, and the number of people who smoke pot my age and older, it's going to happen. In fact, the number that I computed years ago based on the base rates of each of those suggests that we should have had at least 12 of these reported in literature already, so we'll see what happens. But let's not go nuts about this, but keep in mind this is an odd uh, accelerator of heart rate and a lower blood pressure thing, so you know, not the kind of thing you want to smoke pot, go on a big marathon run when you're in your 60s. And then some of these cognitive affective responses, I mentioned that subset of folks who gets anxious or paranoid or dizzy, again, start low and go slow. I prefer vaporized small hits and anything else is probably less advised. Let's keep dosage in mind. Nobody really needs to start the first time at 10 milligrams, something three, two, why not? See how it does. And then CBD present, it's likely to take off that magical ideation and maybe some of the munchies if that's not what you're looking for. Now I'm going to break the potential medical uses down into potential evidence but, which just means I think there's probably better treatments but hey, and potential evidence and you know a few things where it's just no help and, and we'll go from there. Now, potential evidence, I mean, like there really is evidence for this. Arthritis, really, any of the pain syndromes is going to work, but you really have to have the ideal dose. You need that Goldilocks dose. Not too much, not too little, but just right. And that goes all the way back to good old Shenang in 2737 BC. He was the first one to allegedly recommend it. Now, dystonia is sort of a muscle issue where the muscles are going to jerk or uh, tighten up and then loosen up in odd places and seems kind of weird. It's super hard on your sleep. Like you don't think about having a muscle jerk in the middle of the night and waking you up, but it's impossible to sleep. And oh man, anything will will definitely help. As you imagine, they do a lot of muscle relaxants and things like that. I'm not saying cannabis is the ideal thing, but it definitely can help. Now the likely effectives... I'm quite optimistic about all of these uses and feel like we definitely can add cannabis to the armament, so to speak, of potential treatments for this. Now, appetite loss, come on, this is a substance that's got a slang term for its appetite enhancement, the munchies. Obviously, the high CBD strains aren't going to be ideal. There's a lot of variation among strains. But you can find one that's definitely going to enhance appetite. Now, is it a guaranteed put on muscle mass? No. Ideally, you arrange your house so that you definitely have appropriate food to eat. And then lo and behold, it's going to be fine. But if you got a house full of Twinkies, it ain't going to help at all. Now, for HIV-related wasting, um, those kinds of things, we really want to make sure... It's not the only thing. So mega, some of the other steroids that literally are for putting on muscle mass, really important. Cannabis can work in conjunction with that. Make sure you're getting your macros, all of that. It's, it's going to help. Once you get down to one third of your body weight when you have AIDS, like it's hard to come back from that. So this is really important. Life or death. Seizure, I mentioned Dr. Warren Davinsky. The guy's just amazing. And he's given CBD to those kids who have that a uh, special subset of the seizure disorders, and they literally go from 100 to zero when it comes to seizures. Nausea, I mentioned, and vomiting as well. A vaporized substance is bound to work better than any edible substance. Who wants to swallow a pill or even eat a brownie under those circumstances? Uh, I mean, you take Marinol and then you throw it up and you think, that, that's eight bucks. You know, uh, that's a nauseating thought right there. Spasticity, again, I mentioned any of the muscle twitches, it does have potential. Uh, folks with spinal cord injury seem to respond well. It's not the only med, but it definitely can work. Weight loss, again, you know, if you've got appetite loss because of weight loss, this is going to be an adjunct, not your lone treatment. And then the pain and the headache. So 
pain. Again, I mentioned you want an optimal dose. Headache, Ethan Russo's reviewed the migraine literature. Really what you want to do is make sure you've got essentially uh, a flash or anything that tells you a migraine's coming on, run to the vaporizer right then. Don't wait until you're full blown, like head is killing you. That's Imitrex is lying down. But you can really prevent a lot with this if you're vigilant. Tension headache, the balms. Literally, take a, take a THC and CBD balm, put it on your temples as soon as you notice it. Or God forbid, take a nap or meditate for 10 minutes, okay? Tension headache is easily preventable as well and doesn't even necessarily require ingestion of cannabis. The point of this slide is just that I really wanted to emphasize that there is an optimal dose. The medium THC here, the triangles, is the one that seems to be doing the best. Um, this is a fun study where they actually did that capsaicin, that sort of uh, the hot pepper thing that makes your skin burn, and obviously it's not fun, but you have a controlled uh, induction of pain, so we really can say with some optimism uh, this is good evidence that cannabis is good for pain. Uh, again, I'm just trying to make that same point, that uh, vaporized cannabis is, is going to be great, but you want a mod modest dose, not necessarily a really big one or a really small one's not going to kick it in. Now, these disorders have some promise. I mentioned these in class. Alzheimer's, Gary Wank has some data on a number of different uh, antioxidants and some of the tau proteins, some of the things that we had that don't necessarily work well. Um, I mean, Alzheimer's don't wait too late. Now, you know, everybody I know over 70 guarantees me that they've got it all, but odds are high you can make this kind of thing happen and uh, at least prepare yourself for the antioxidant properties. But more importantly, Alzheimer's management. I mentioned my mom had dementia at the end. It's, it's pretty grueling. It's hard to watch. But uh, demented patients get violent. They don't eat well. Uh, they're irritable. What a surprise. A little medical cannabis might help. ALS, uh, that's what Stephen Hawking had. They used to call it Lou Gehrig's disease. I don't know about it actually fixing the neurons, um, although there are some you know, petri dish level data suggestive of that, as well as a bunch of other antioxidants, um, but the drooling. So I mentioned Dr. Greg Carter out in Washington. He's shown that a lot of the social isolation tends to come from people with ALS. Because the muscles aren't working right, they can't swallow right, and they drool. They can't swallow. So they don't want to talk because they don't want to spit on somebody. I can hardly blame them. Here's a chance to take what most people think of as a negative side effect, cotton mouth, and turn it into a treatment for somebody who really could use the help. Diabetes, this is controversial, but at least some studies suggest uh, some of the balance between sugar and insulin might improve with cannabis. I'm always apprehensive about this because of the munchies thing, and like obviously you can't get really stoned and go eat a donut and have anything go well. And then it does bring up the fact that uh, multiple large data sets have now shown cannabis users have a BMI that is better, that is lower than non-cannabis users. I've got those data with the eating disorders, but I can't seem to get them published. Even anorexics say they let themselves off the hook and they go ahead and, and let themselves eat. Binge eaters say they can pay attention to the food and suddenly slow down. Really does have some potential there. <clears throat> Fibromyalgia is hard to diagnose. It's controversial. Some people don't even believe it exists, which I think is completely unfair. But you do so pain and the muscle stiffness. Obviously, cannabis at the right dose has some potential, but some people don't react to it well, and some people do. The GI, the Crohn's disease, uh, a meta-analysis came out. Basically, it only could find three randomized clinical trials. Some of them worked. Some of them didn't. I'm guessing this may be strain-dependent, so you really do have to have the right strain. Uh, folks I know with IBS do claim, irritable bowel, claim that it does help. Um, other folks, it, it's not so good, but hey, that's how a lot of meds work. All right, they were going to have uh, 
the first clinical trial on gliomas. They're gathering data. I'm not sure if that is done yet. Hepatitis, I uh, just want to emphasize the hepatitis management. A lot of the meds for hepatitis are super nauseating. And basically somebody discovered that uh, folks who were willing to take their meds more were going to do better. And cannabis made them less nauseated by their meds so they could stick to their treatment plan. The incontinence uh, is curious. Um, it's kind of hard to explain, but like the, the latency to go ahead and start a urine flow can change uh, in response to some cannabinoids. And so this may or, or may not work. You see this a lot in MS patients and people with spinal cord injury as well. Uh, MS itself has a really disparate <clears throat> set of responses. I've seen case studies where people really do swear by it. Other folks say it just makes them paranoid. So the chance to talk about prohibition is always worthwhile. I have this quote from Otto von Bismarck, not that I think he is a great guy or anything. I just love this quote. I actually showed this for two years before I became a vegan. Uh, Laws are like sausages. It's better not to see them being made. Odds are high the way prohibition passed is not the way most folks think it passed. When you go back to Marijuana Tax Act in 1937, it looked like nobody even knew what marijuana was because Anslinger had basically taken cannabis and grabbed some Spanish slang for bad tobacco and suddenly was signing treaties about it and trying to get federal laws passed. It was really, uh, I got to admit, quite a shame. Uh, these data are old, but my, my real point here is that, look, far and away, the most cannabis users are Caucasians and, dare I say, Caucasian males. Obviously, if there was no racial bias in enforcement of possession laws, you would think, well, three-fourths of people are white who use cannabis, so three-fourths of the arrests are probably cannabis. No. <clears throat> Unfortunately, depending upon which individual state in the U.S. you look at, uh, people of color are three or four times more likely to get arrested. It's been that way for quite some time. Harry Levine has shown data going back to the 90s, really disheartening issues where just the enforcement of this law is not at random. Now, when I talk to law enforcement officers, they say, look, Mitch, whoever is dealing outside, who's ever selling cannabis out in the open is more likely to get arrested. And it just so happens that happens in minority neighborhoods. I don't think, you know, it has anything to do with race so much as socioeconomic status, unless, and dare I say it, a subset of police officers really are um, more likely to arrest folks who are non-white. Well, my big deal about prohibition is it was supposed to do something, right? If we're going to prohibit something, that means it should be less available. Any of the problems associated with its availability should decrease. And ideally, we had hoped that if people had their time freed up in law enforcement because they weren't taking somebody down the street in order to, you know, fingerprint them for an eighth, they would have more time to, you know, protect us, protect everybody else. Those data were promising initially. It's uh, hard to replicate. Kevin Sabet was kind of ribbing me about this the last time I saw him, and I hate to say it, it it's, it's not panning out the way I had hoped. I will admit I tooted that horn as loudly as anyone, saying it's going to save law enforcement time and other crimes are going to go down. Initially, some larceny, you know, auto theft, things like that, and even violent crime seemed to decrease with medical and decrim laws. It doesn't seem to be replicating well, at least not across all states. These data just show the rather embarrassing disparate rate of marijuana possession arrests for folks who are African or Caribbean descent versus Caucasians. These are different counties in California. Some of them are just super disheartening. So obviously a whole lot more 
black folks per capita are getting arrested than white folks per capita, even though we know white folks account for most of the cannabis possession and use. So something bad is going on here. And that's part of why I would like to turn to that tax and regulated market. All right. All right. Now, the chronic effects are intriguing because we want to say, okay, does something happen to the brain after a couple years of regular heavy use, but not when you're high acutely? So that alone is a pretty big deal. So we've talked about uh, some of the research at Harvard, Harrison Pope, I think Stacy Gruber does this as well, where they'll have people spend the night at the hospital and not have cannabis easily accessible in order to make sure that they really, you know, are not high when they're taking the test later. Either way, whether you do find an effect or you don't find an effect, I want to make sure the choice of tests is appropriate. So the test difficulty is something that matters. I occasionally get a uh, evidence and they say, hey, Mitch, uh, cannabis years of use doesn't do anything. Look, we have these data. And I'll say, well, what was your test? And they say, it's the mini mental state exam. Well, the mini mental state exam asks things like, who's the president and what day is it? I'm not impressed that <laughs> heavy use doesn't do anything to that. In contrast, if uh, the test is just super hard and everybody gets a zero, you can also end up looking like uh, there's no effect when really it's just that nobody had any variance in the scores. Finally, occasionally I'll get these giant epidemiological things where they say, hey, we found a significant effect. And, you know, the means are a, a tenth of a standard deviation apart, but the sample size was so huge that reached statistical significance. And so what can I say? And these are some of those word learning paradigms where you've got, you know, 15 words to learn on a list and the cannabis users remember 14 and the non-users remember 14.5. So, I mean, come on. Uh, if you smoke pot, you'll forget half a word. I just can't get too worked up about that. Trying to remember dictionary, you won't remember dictionary. Well, we've been struggling to get laws to grow hemp right here in the U.S. again, all the way back uh, at least 1999, actually some really intriguing ones way before that. Um, but right now, the one that seems to be getting the most play is the 2018 Farm Bill. Folks I know who are really involved in hemp claim that they, you know, don't, don't like it enough, but they're... Uh, a lot of folks seem to think it's certainly better than what we did have, so we should be seeing some hemp grown in the U.S. By the time I post this, the laws could change 12 times. So let's hope for the best, and if you do happen to see a hemp product, uh, if you're willing to spend for it, I assure you it'll be uh, a thing to do.